Good morning, everyone. How are you all doing? Hope everybody is doing well. All right. If everybody can stand up, let's um, give somebody next to you a high five. All right. How is everybody doing? Good. Amen. If, if today we can go to church, it's a blessing from the Lord. Amen. What a blessing it is. Father, we thank you. We praise you for today, God. We are so grateful, Father, that we can come to church, Lord, and we know we are here because of your grace, Lord. And as we wait upon you, Lord Jesus, strength will rise. In Jesus' name, everybody say, Amen. All right, let's sing this song together, Everlasting God. Good to see all of you here. I uh, just want to say hello to all of you. If you haven't been here for a while, it's so good to see you, my friend Stan. And we're going to get started with a, a prayer. So uh, 
Angie uh, says that she's going to pray for our opening. So would you come forward, Angie, and grab, grab a mic on, on the way here, Angie, so that... Um, let's go. Yay. Hello. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to pray. Okay. Dear Jesus, thank you for thank bringing you, us um, all here today. Thank you for gathering us here today. We're so blessed by you that you've given us um, everything. Uh, we have the chance to wake up every day, especially yeah. on Sunday, and we get to come here and worship Jesus. you and give you all of our love. Um, we hope that with the message that you give us today and that we receive today, we are able to leave with that message and we're able to spread your word to everybody. Um, and spreading your love, your like, and everything that you can do, everything that you've in your power. Um, we pray that uh, we pray over our families, our friends, and everything that's like anything that's going on in our personal lives. We pray over um, over each and every one of everybody else. Um, and we hope that as we leave this room today, as we leave this church, and as we exit, we're able to leave with the feeling of wisdom, hope, love, uh, and we hope that we continue to go forward with our faith in you, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Can you say somebody next to you, it's good to see you? If you can wave to somebody in front of you, behind you, next to you, and tell them it's good to see you.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we prepare our hearts today, God, to listen to your words. We know, Lord, you are here with us. For when two and three people are get, gathered together in your name, your word says, Lord, that you are there among them. We praise you and we love you. Speak to us, O oh God. pray for you those of us who are in this room would you stretch your hand toward them we're gonna pray over our amazing children in this place father God we pray for each and every one of them we pray Lord that 
the purpose of God and the will of God will be fulfilled in their life. We pray that they will get to know you more and more and we thank you that they get to know you since um, they're really, really young and we pray that they'll continue to grow in their relationship with you, in their knowledge with you, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that there's this big vision and big dream that you plant in their heart and the vision that is so big that required them to rely on you fully we pray that they will have a big dream and vision for your kingdom and we pray that you will continue to use their life to be a blessing to the people around them and for the parents we just feel honored that we have the opportunity to walk alongside with them and we have the opportunity to also uh, uh, teach them about you lord and of course we want to pray for all the sunday school teacher thank you lord for their faithfulness that uh thank you for their investment in the life of these children week in and week out they are faithfully serving you lord they are faithfully serving these kids and we pray and we pray that they will they know all these teacher know that they make a big impact in this children's life we love you god in jesus name we pray all of us says amen amen Go ahead, kids. Hey, by the way, do you guys appreciate our worship team? Yeah, yeah, you guys can clap. Whether it's one person, two people, <laughs> or five people on the stage, they always give their best to serve. So allow me to pray one more time before we get started with our message. Father God, we come to you uh, with open heart that we're ready to listen to your words. Speak to each and every one of us. We truly believe that you have a message for us. We want to come with the posture of humility and we, with the posture of faith, knowing that you are able to give us a timely message. We love you. Again, speak to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. All of us say, Amen. You may be seated, church. Most people are familiar with the story of David. We see him throughout history in music, literature, and art. David is this amazing hero, an elegant poet, and he seems to have this impossibly close relationship with God, the kind of relationship that only an iconic Bible character could have. But when you look closer, you see his flaws on display. And despite the years in between our lifetimes, his story starts to look a lot like our own. The truth is, the story of David is the story of all of us. A perfect God loving an imperfect person. If I show you the picture of these people here on the slide, do you recognize each one of them? Do you happen to know the backstories of how they get to where they are? You know, Michael Jordan, um, I'm a big fan of Michael Jordan. Um, you know, one time I, I buy this, uh, uh, the, the, the real size of this board that looks Michael Jordan-like, but I didn't tell my mom. So the next morning when she walked in my room, like in the, you know, it was really dark. And when she turned on the lights, she was really scared. She thought somebody was standing there six foot six, right? They were like, but anyway, Michael Jordan, if you don't know his story, um, in, in high school, he got cut from uh, the varsity team, from the basketball team. And the rest is history. You know that some people consider him uh, the GOAT, uh, the greatest uh, of all time uh, in terms of the basketball player. Uh, next is J.K. Rowling. You know who J.K. Rowling is, right? There you go, Harry Potter, right? J.K. Rowling, uh, she actually got fired from her job as a secretary in London, England. You know what's the reason? She daydreamed too much. She got fired, and you know, long story short, she is now the author. She is the first author that reached uh, $1 billion of net worth. Um, you know, some of you, well, most of you know uh, the, the most famous book series, probably Harry Potter. You know, it turned into a movie as well. Oprah Winfrey, at one point, when he, she, was, she used to work at this Baltimore uh, uh, news TV station, right? She was, this is the exact word from the producer at the TV station. She is unfit for 
television. She is unfit for television. And now you know her story. She's actually the first black female billionaire, right? Um, and then last but not least, uh, I guess our very own Sylvester Stallone, St uh, Stallone right? Uh, see, he was actually offered $360,000. This was back in the 1970s uh, for his movie script. Right? Uh, we're going to buy your movie script, but with one condition that you're not going to be in the movie, says the uh, uh, studio. Right? And he, with not very much money at all, barely any money in his bank account, he stood uh, you know, on his decision, you know, if I was going to sell this movie script, I want to play in my movie. Long story short, that's the script of the movie Rocky. And you know that uh, up to this day, it's one of the biggest movie. Uh, it generated billion dollars up until this moment. And Sylvester Stallone is uh, uh, one of the biggest movie star now. So we're going to start uh, today's message, as I promised you last Sunday, uh, that, that you know, we've been in this series called David. We are looking at the life of David. Right, uh, David, you know, he has many nicknames, the shepherd boy, the giant killer, giant slayer, and some people consider he is the greatest king that the ancient Israel have ever have, have ever had, right? Uh, but I think if you ask David, I think his favorite nickname would be a man after God's own heart. Because this nickname, a man after God's own heart, is God himself who gave it to David. Right, but so I, I promised you last week that we are going to talk about the, one of the most well-known story. Whether you are uh, grew up in church or or, or you, whether you grew up in church or maybe you, you you're not a Christian, but you heard this story before. There is about David and Goliath. Last week we talked about uh, the background of David's life, how he got chosen to be the second king of Israel. But at the time when there's this prophet named Samuel pray for David, he was actually around 12 to 15 years old. So he didn't actually become a king until he was 30 years old when the first king of Israel, King Saul, died. Right? But you know, he was, uh, Samuel is ordained them. We call it, the, he, uh, he's being anointed at the age of between 12 or 15 years old. Now, uh, the story of David and Goliath is actually David was around maybe 15 to 17 years old when he fought Goliath. But before we look at this story, I just want to, I'm just very curious, right? What is it about us that love uh, underdog story? You, you love underdog story? Right? Do you know the, the term underdog? Have you ever heard about that? Right? I was doing a little bit of uh, Googling, you know, and um, underdog, the term underdog is actually started in, in, in around 1800. It started from this illegal uh, dog fighting um, that happened back then, and then the, the losing dog is called the underdog, right? Today, we use the term underdog is for someone or a team that most likely uh, that, that, that most likely to lose, right, the, the weaker team. Yeah, I think you all know. I don't have to explain it uh, uh, too much about the underdog, right? But, but what I'm very curious is that what is it about us that love the underdog story? I mean, if you think about it, the movie that we watch, right, the reason why we watch sports, the reason why we love some, uh, uh, the story that inspire us about how uh, uh, someone come, uh, come from nothing and then they finally made it, a, a team that's supposed to, uh, they're supposed to lose and they ended up winning, right? Uh, the, 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 the people or the person who don't have a lot and they, 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 they uh, you know, they, you know, they, they made it. They, they become uh, someone who is uh, uh, successful, right? Again, what is it about us that love the underdog stories? What, what, why, why do you think it is the reason? Do you guys have, yeah, what, what's the reason, Kim? What do you think is the reason? There you go, right? It, it gives us a sense of hope. That's the reason why we love, right? Uh, it it allows us to dream big. Right, because it all it, it, it tells us that hey, nothing is impossible. Right, hey, dream big because again, you don't know what happened. Right, it, again, it gives us this sense of hope, and again, it you know, and then I, I I feel like in inside of every human being, we want we all want justice. Right, in a sense, when someone who have when when we see someone who have less, we feel like it's it's, it's something. Uh, this is injustice. Right, this is not just. 
right? But and then when when that somebody who don't have much and he and he made it or or, or she made it, right? We feel like there's there's justice there, right? And then of course uh, we feel more joy. We are happier when we see uh, this unexpected success. Um, that's some of the reason that I found out when I was trying to just kind of do a little bit of research of why people love underdog story. So, with that being said, let's jump into this story. This is the ultimate underdog story, right? We use this term in our culture, right? Even for the non-Christian, they use this term. If they see someone that, that is most likely to use, uh, lose or they, they have, there's a sport team that play against uh, the, the, the su- more superior team, we said, man, this is like David and Goliath. And we use those terms, we use that term in our culture. So we're going to look at that story. And the reason why, by the way, just want to remind you, the reason why we are doing the message series about David life is this, we say this, is because when we look at David life, we can actually relate to him. Here is the king, David. Right? But actually, if you study his life, he failed over and over again, right? He made a big mess, right? He, he sinned, right? But there's something about David. I don't know if it's his personality. I don't know if his humility. I don't know if his character, right? That always turn back to God. And, and, and with, despite all of the failure, all of the sin, all of the mistake that David made, God still called him a man after my own heart. So that's the reason why we get into this message series about David life. So let's jump in into this story. One day, you can follow along, you can look at the screen or you can open up your Bible if you have. 1 Samuel chapter 17, one day, the Philistine now mustered their army for battle and came between Soko in Judah and Azekah at Ephes Damim. Saul countered by gathering his Israel troop near the valley of Elah. So the Philistine and the Israelites faced each other on the opposite hills with the valley between them. So here we are. We have two different sides, right? There's the Israelites and then there's the Philistine. And they are ready to go to war. They are facing off each other, right? And they are, one is on the one hill and the Philistine is on the other hill. And in the middle of them, there's this valley called the Valley of El- Elah, right? And, 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 and verse 4 says this, And then Goliath, here come Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath came out from Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. And he was over nine feet tall he's like nine to be exactly he's like nine foot six so it has about where basketball rim is basketball rim is like 10 um 10 foot right so basically if you look at uh, G- goliath from close by you're going to look at him like that he's like really huge and it says here gaff I mean, I don't know. The name himself is sounds scary, right? Goliath from Gath, right? It just sounds like, you know, this guy's a freak, right? Goliath from Gath, right? Uh, by the way, Gath, if you read the book of Chronicle in your Bible, the Gath, this is where the giant live, the land of Gath. This is, the, the, the people over there is extremely large, right? They're tall, right? I mean, if, 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 if the NBA team today looking for talent, they would go to the land of Gath because the people are huge. These are where giants live. Everything about the people, you know, like everything bigger in Texas, right? But everything bigger in Gath, everything is gigantic in Gath. And, says he's not, and he's not only that, he's a champion. In other words, he's the best of the best from the Philistine side. And, and I don't have it here because there's a lot of Bible verse. I, I'm going to jump around. I don't, I'm not going to display all the verse on 1 Samuel 17. But it says that he wears armor that weighed over 100 pounds. Can you imagine an armor? He's walking around with an armor that, that weighed over 100 pounds. His spears, even the tip, is a weight over 15 pounds. So that's really like, I mean, this guy huge, right? And it says here, for 40 days and every morning and evening, the Philistine champion, Goliath, strutted in front of the Israel's army. So for 40 days and 40 nights, 
twice a day, in the morning and in the afternoon, this giant came out in front of the Israel army and he kept taunting them, right? Ha, you guys are a loser. Come on. Nobody wants to fight me. Come on, right? He kept ta taunting them, taunting them, right? And then when Samuel and the Israel heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. They're not only afraid, they're not only terrified, but they were deeply shaken. So, I mean, you can imagine for a minute, right? This is a scary, scary dude. And every single day, he was just stand there, and then he just kept taunting the, the, taunting the uh, Israel army. Now, I want to stop here for a minute. Do you have Goliath in your life? How do you know if you have Goliath in your life? I think Goliath represents this problem that we have, this struggle, these challenges, this situation that we have that is so big, right? That is so large that causes us to live in fear. That's how I would define Goliath in your life and in my life. And this fear, it just won't go away. Just like Goliath in this story, it keeps haunted us they keep following us right keep you up at night you cannot go to sleep right you cannot forget it you forget it for a few minutes and then as soon as you remember that thing it's going to paralyze you in fear it's going to bring you down because goliath is not about his size right but it, it, it's about his effect to us Right? It influences our emotional health, our physical health, right? our spiritual life. Right? I don't know what it is today. Do you have Goliath in your life? Maybe it's the situation at home, in, in, in your marriage, in your career, in your job. Right? Maybe it's our physical condition. We have this sickness that we carry. Right? Maybe it's, it's our, em our emotional health, again, our mental health. Maybe it's our addiction, right? whether it's drugs or maybe you know, just this, we cannot sleep without this sleeping pill. Right? I don't know whether it's a drink, alcohol, or maybe we are addicted to porn. What is the giant in your life? What is the Goliath in your life? Or maybe it's our job situation, our financial situation, your school, your future, right? Those of you who keep up with the news, every time you watch the news, you get so worried and you get so paralyzed in fear. What, you know, what about this political climate? What about this economic condition of our country, right? I, I, am I going to be okay in the future? I am barely make a, 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 the standard of living. I barely able to afford the basic living needs. Why am I gonna, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my children? What's going to happen to my family in the future? Whatever the giant that you are facing today, it just won't go away, right? Just like Goliath, 40 days and 40 nights, twice a day, right? Just, again, come out and intimidate us. Basically, Goliath just say, hey, I'm here. What are you going to do about it? And Goliath said, I defy the army of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. Come on, I challenge you. Send someone from your side to fight me. You know, this is actually very common back then when there's two sided, sides of going, you know, they're going to war, right? The, the one side will send the one person, that, that, that the best uh, uh, warrior, if you will, and the other. So they're going to go one-on-one, -on -one, right? Uh, send someone who represent your side and we send someone, right? And then if that guy win, then the, 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 the victory will be imputed, will be credited to the whole thing. In other words, if our guy win, then everybody win. If our guy lose, then everybody lose. So it's very common, right? But I want you to hold that thought for a minute, and we're going to circle back at the end of the message about this. But what's happening here, Goliath, the champion of Philistine, represent Philistine. Right? And he was asking, like, okay, I'm representing Philistine. Who's going to represent Israel? And it's cricket. Nobody wants to go. And everybody look at each other. You go. No, nah, man, you go. No, no, you go. No, nah, you go. Right? And everybody, of course, when nobody wants to go, everybody looking at their leader, King Saul. 
right? After all, King Saul, if you remember or if you've read his story before, he got selected to be the king of Israel, to be the first king of Israel because he is head and shoulder taller than everybody else. But the thing is, when the king, the leader, the biggest guy in Israel, when he said that I'm going out there, the rest of the people go like, oh, I'm not going out there too, right? And one day, a guy named Jesse said to David, take this basket of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread, carry them quickly to your brothers. If you hear last week, you know that Jesse is actually uh, David's father, right? Uh, Jesse has uh, eight sons. One of them is David. And three of David's brother is actually part of the Israelites' army. And one day, Jesse said to David, hey, bring this lunch to your brothers in the battlefield. And, and, and you know, give, give, give me an update what's going on with them, right? Since we don't have Uber Eats, we don't have, the, you know, uh, DoorDash, right? You take them, David. And David went to see his brother in the Valley of Elah. And when David got there, this is what happened. Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. When David got there, it happened to be the same exact time when actually Goliath do his usual thing. You know that 40 days, 49, twice a day, the usual taunt, right? You guys are loser. Nobody want to fight me. Come on, what you going to do about it? I'm here, na, 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 right? And David heard about that. As soon as the Israel army saw him, so Goliath, they began to run away in fright. The army was terrified and people began to shout, yo, you see how big Goliath is? And everybody ran, right? And then the people began to talk among them. Hey, did you hear what the king says? Anyone who can defeat Goliath, you get to marry his daughter. You get to live in the palace. That's what the king said. That's the reward. And, and, and that's not all of it. Here, there's another one here. And this next one, I'm sure you will fight Goliath for it. He said, that, he said that if you fight Goliath, you don't have to pay taxes for the rest of your life. Right? All of us will fight Goliath, you know, if that's a reward. Right? <laughs> you don't have to pay tax for the rest of your life. And, you know, David began to ask them around, is that true? Is it true? That's the reward? I will get all of those if I fight Goliath, right? But, and then when David began to talk to the people, making sure if that's true, if that's the reward that he's going to get if he fight Goliath, when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the man, he was angry. What are you doing here anyway? He demanded, what about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You want to see the battle. When David brothers saw David talking to the army he's like, and going around talking to the other soldiers, they were like, what are you doing here, David? Right? Who's watching daddy's sheep and goat? Right? Aren't you supposed to watch them? You, why are you here to be all up in people's business, right? It's just a typical of like older brother to the younger brother or older sister, to, you know, the younger siblings, right? What are you doing here? And David was like, what have I done? I'm not doing anything wrong, right? I didn't do anything, right? I, I think at this moment, if you ask for my opinion, the way I read this story, right? David's eyes has set to the reward, right? He doesn't care how big Goliath is. All he thinks about is his reward. Maybe, again, if, you know, I could be wrong. Maybe he's just tired of being overlooked, right? Here you are, um, you know, his brother gets to go to the army. He has to take care of the sheep and goat, right? Man, let me beat this Goliath so I can marry the king's daughter. I can live in the palace. Maybe that's what he's thinking, right? His, 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 his focus, his eyes is just set on the reward, right? When you have different perspective. You will do different things, right? I, I don't know if you heard this story before. Um, you know, there's this kid 
uh, you know, lost his contact lens, right? He dropped it, and he, he's looking for it for 30 minutes, right? And when he's looking for it for after 30 minutes, he, he came to his mom. He said, Mom, I lost my contact lens, and I've been looking for it for 30 minutes, and I couldn't find it. And the mom was like, where did you drop it? In which I, and the kids was like, yeah, I think it's around this area where I drop it. And then in three minutes, the mom found the contact lens. Do you know what's the reason? Because they're looking for different things. For the kids, he's looking for a contact lens. For the mom, he's looking for $250, right? For some of you don't get it, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't tell them, right? No, no, no. For the kid, he's looking for his contact lens. For his mom, it's like, if I don't find this, his contact lens, I'm going to have to buy him another new contact lens for 250 See, when you have different perspective, you know, and by the way, all the parents say, amen, there you go. <laughs> you know, when you are, when you're having different perspective, you know, you're going you're gonna to do anything, right? And that's what David is eyeing, you know, the reward, right? Then David went, I know, I'll do it. And then here's the response of King Saul. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine, this Goliath, and possibly win. You are only a boy. And he's been a man of war since his youth. Come on, you are no match for Goliath. And David was trying to give King Saul his resume. You know, like, look, I've been taking off my dad, goat, and sheep. Right? When the bear and the lion attack, you know, my goat and my sheep, I kill them with the club. And sometimes I kill them with my bare hands, right? Uh, you know, is that, is that count? Says David, right? And here's what David says, and I think this is the key of everything. I, we're going to go into a theology a little bit here, and I want you to catch this, okay? David says this, your servant has killed both the lions and the bear. And then this is what he said, this, what's the word there? Can you help me read it? Uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the army of the living God. Here is the angle. Here is the perspective that nobody sees. And the only person who sees this was David. And if you read this story, you will find out that David kept repeating this word, this uncircumcised Philistine, this uncircumcised giant, right? And David looked at this whole thing from the spiritual perspective. Let me explain. Give me two minutes. In the context of the ancient Jews, right, the circumcision is the sign that you belong to God. See, male circumcision means that you are in the covenant with God. God basically make a covenant, make a promise, right? That I will be your God and you will be my people. And God's covenant passed from generation to generation. This is why he declared, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac, right? Abraham is Isaac's father. And I am the God of Jacob. Isaac is Jacob's father. So the covenant of God goes from generation to generation, Right? By getting circumcised, that covenant, that blessing, that protection that God promised to their ancestor, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, will also belong to you. Now, let me stop here for a minute because I see some nervous guy in this room. You don't have to go home and make an appointment with your doctor to get surgery, okay? You don't need to do that because we are under new covenant, Right? And, and, you know, there's this uh, new covenant. If there's new covenant, that means there's old covenant, right? In your Bible, there's a, an Old Testament, New Testament, right? Meaning that there's this old covenant and there's this new covenant. And, 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 and the old covenant is before Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection. And the new covenant is after the cross and the resurrection. That's the new covenant. So, in the new covenant, you don't need to do physical circumcision, right? The scripture used the term, the circumcision of your heart. In other words, you enter the covenant with God through believing in Jesus. 
Basically, you're giving your heart, you're giving your life, you are trusting your whole life to Jesus, and that's how you and me enter the new covenant with God. So no surgery, guys. Thank God. So back to the uh, story. David keeps saying, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this uncircumcised giant who dare to challenge the army of the living God? What David is saying is, I see somebody who does not belong to God. I see somebody who does not get the help of God. I see somebody who doesn't have God on his back. And bro, you're in trouble. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. If you pay attention to the language of David, he's always shifting the focus to God. God will hand you to me. God will rescue me. God will do this battle for me, right? And, and right before uh, David try to fight a giant and Saul was like, you know, you might as well use my armor, right? And, 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 and David said, you know what? The God who rescued me from the lion and the bear will also rescue me from Goliath. <laughs> and Saul says to David, go, may the Lord be with you, right? Some of you have friends like this, right? Hey, I'll be praying for you. <laughs> hey, can you give me a hand? I'm, I'm moving next week. No, I cannot make it. I'll pray for you, man. <laughs> That's what Saul did. You know, go. Go fight Goliath. I'll be praying for you. May the Lord be with you, right? And then Saul, well, since I'm not using my armor, since I'm not fighting the Goliath, here, why don't you use my armor, right? And then David tried to put it on. Again, remember, Saul is big, he's huge, and David is small, and it was heavy, it was too big. I cannot wear this, says David. In other words, David says, this, I mean, this is not how I flow, right? I, I, just cannot do, I just cannot wear this. And what David did instead, he picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine, to fight Goliath. He picked up five stones. You know why he picked up five stones? Do you know why? Because Goliath had four brothers. David was going to take care of them all. Whew. And he's not planning to miss one stone for each one of them. And David approached Goliath with his slingshot, right? And the stones and the staff. But Goliath was cursing at David. It's like, you think I'm a dog? You come with me with a stake, says Goliath. And he started cursing David, right? Bleep, 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 right? And, and I love the next three verse here. I, I feel like I want to print this out and then just stick it on my wall, right? Just I want to see it every day and pay attention here in the next three verse. David replied to the Philistine, you came to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you. In the name of the Lord's heaven's army, the God of the army of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you. I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know. That the Lord rescue his people, but not with the sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. You pay attention to David's language. Everything is about God because he knows this is not his battle. Right? And as Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd bag, right? Taking out of the stone. He hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. For people, Goliath is too big to fight. 
for David, Goliath is too big to miss. He hurled his slingshot, hit it on the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. On the ground. There's no fight, right? One hit, he's down. A quick fight. And David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone for he had no sword. He didn't have even, he didn't carry a sword. He bring his slingshot and his stone fighting the giant. And David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. And then David used it to kill him and cut off his head. Now that's gangster, right? right? You kill Goliath with his own sword. And that's the story of David and Goliath. I have about four minutes. I want to finish with this. As a pastor who preached this so many times, those of you who have been going to church so long, you heard about this story so many times, I started to wonder. Again, this is just me. I don't know how you're going to read this, right? And you can disagree with me. I started to wonder if Goliath, if defeating Goliath in this story is actually the easiest task in the battle. What I meant is this. When David actually face to face with Goliath, right? Or maybe face to belly since he's really tall, right? <laughs> when he's actually face to face with Goliath, that's actually the easiest part of the battle. Right? Because... It happens so quickly, one hit, he's down, he's dead, and that's it, right? But in order for David to get to that point where he can go face-to-face with Goliath, there's a lot of battles, there's a lot of challenges that he had to overcome. Have you ever thought about that? He had to face what I call delay. Delay meaning that... All of David's brother get to join the army. Here David, he need to take care of the sheep and goat. And it's not even a lot of sheep and goat. It's only two or three goat, right? In other words, he was holed up by his own family to maximize his potential. He has so much potential, right? He could have joined the army and he could have been very successful in the army. But he was holed up. He has to face delay and he has to learn to be patient. He has to overcome delay. Another one, before he fight Goliath, he has to overcome what we call discouragement. Before he actually face off with Goliath, every single day for 40 days and 40 nights, he has to hurt Goliath taunting them. You are a loser, right? You are a coward. Nobody wants to fight me, says Goliath. He has to hear that intimidation, right? Discouragement. And he has to learn to overcome that. And David has to learn to overcome besides delay, besides discouragement. This is what I call the disapproval. He showed up in the battlefield and the brothers say, what are you doing here? Right? Who's, who's going to take care of that uh, sheep and goat? Right? You don't belong here, says the brother. And then, of course... He has to overcome. There's delay, discouragement, disapproval. He has to overcome what I call doubt. King Saul says, you are too young. Man, you are too inexperienced. Look at Goliath. He is, he's been a champion since he's really young. He's been a warrior of war since he's really young. And King Saul, his leader... Doubted David. That's the reason why I started to wonder that what if the biggest enemy, Goliath himself, is actually part, it's actually the easiest task compared to all, right? What if your Goliath is actually the easiest part of what you are going to face? In other words, when you're experiencing a problem, a struggle, that issue itself is probably the easier task compared to everything that you have to overcome, right? When you're experiencing problem, you get discouraged, you started to lose hope, right? So, so you have to overcome that. 
I don't know if you catch what I mean, right? But, but the problem itself, the Goliath itself is actually the easier part. But there are a lot of things that you have to overcome. And another reason why I said that Goliath is the easier part is because Goliath, your problem, your struggle, that's the Lord's battle. The battle is the Lord. It belongs to the Lord, right? You have to overcome. You have to continue to persevere. You have to, uh, you know, stay hopeful, right? You have to stay encouraged, right? All of those is our part. But the problem itself, the Goliath itself, is actually the Lord's part. Remember the part that I told you to just remember? I want to circle back to that. The part where Goliath challenged the army of Israel. Come on, send someone to fight me. Let's make this a one-on-one battle. Like I said, it's very common during the ancient war. Each side sent a warrior and if your warrior win, then everybody win. If your warrior lose, everybody lose. I'm not sure if you know where I'm going with this. But one time, God sent his warrior named Adam. But he lost. And as a result, we all lost. The Bible said because Adam sinned, we are born With that seed of sin in us. He lost and we all lost. But thankfully the story did not stop there. God sent us another warrior. His name is Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect life. Without sin. He overcome the death. He fulfilled his mission to go on the cross. To take the sin of the world. And he died for all of us. And on the third day he rose from the dead. He won because Jesus won. His victory is imputed and credited to us. One man lost, one man sinned, we all sin. That's not fair, Sam. I know it's not fair. But Jesus win. We didn't go to the cross. Everything that Jesus did, he did it by himself. We didn't take any part of it. But when he win, we all win. I'm going to read you the last verse and then Pastor Bobby, would you close in prayer? For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even God's greater, even the greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. So whatever your Goliath is today, remember, you're the giant Goliath. It belongs to the Lord, not you. The battle belongs to him. Your part is to continue to persevere, to be encouraged, to stay hopeful, and to trust God that he's going to take care of it. Because Jesus win, all of us win. Can I invite all of you to stand up and let's close in prayer. Amen. Let's stand on our feet, everyone. And let's receive the blessings from the Lord. How many of you are blessed by today's sermon? Amen. Those of you at home too, we pray that you'll be blessed and you can join us on, in person, on site, hopefully next week. So if you're at home, I invite you to stand on your feet as well and receive blessings from God. Let's all pray together. Father God, we thank you and we praise you. Thank you for the day we're able to get up, Father, to go to church. And we are blessed, Father, because we are healthy today, God. And Lord, if there's any of us who are ill, Father, who are sick, Father, we pray for healing in Jesus' name. If any of our family members are sick, Lord, we pray for healing in Jesus' name too. Lord, may you bless your sons and daughters here. Church, may the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord shines his face upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord himself lifts up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, God's people say, Amen. God bless you, and we'll see you next Sunday.